we are going to now transition to um, a bit of discussion of uh, this next next exercise. And those online um, will know that you know we'll be um, uh, we'll be having this exercise uh, here uh, with the uh, modeling groups. But um, uh, I'd like you to uh, to feel free to you know stay in for my my initial comments here. So I want to draw our attention to this um, not bad, um, uh, to these materials that uh, I had made available on the um, the site. And I'm just going to go find them here. Somehow they the uh, the right window here it is. Okay, great. So it's these model conceptualization. Oh, sorry, I should turn on the screen share for our partners here. Okay. Um, so within this material, um, I had uh, it placed uh, a couple of things that I'd like you to comment on. The first is uh, I want I want you to see if you can try um, try using this division to think through some of the factors that you would like to have to start with, with your model. This is, I'm gonna ask you to do it with kind of two, two ideas in mind. One, two time points in mind. One is when you're starting out, what's the division between endogenous, endogenous and ignored um, for your model um, for a starting place? What, you know, with a minimal thing you want in there, what do you, what do you need to start with for endogenous, exogenous, ignored? And then, and then for the model you'd ultimately like to get to, um, you know, you, you really think could be good. If you want to try that again, you're welcome to. But, you know, what things really need to be endogenous, exogenous, ignored? I'm distinguishing these two things because we have to get started, you know, we start small. We, um, Big baby steps. So at first, there's probably going to be a few things endogenous, few things exogenous, kind of a minimal set there, and maybe lots of things ignored. And then where you'd eventually like to go, you might have a, of a different trip. Maybe you got more things endogenous, exogenous, somewhat fewer ignored. Um, uh, I'd like you to think this through. So, so that's uh, challenge one. Um, uh, and there may be some people who work on that on from now to lunch. There may be some people who who end up um, you know wanting to, to to go on to this other other component. Um, so the second component here that I want you to, to to explore is this one. It's described in this document. So um Endogenous exogenous ignored tells us about the scope of our model. But kind of tells us what things we want to sort of characterize their interactions. Um, but it doesn't point us to how we're going to capture it in a, in a model. Um, and uh, one intermediate point would be, and I apologize for sort of going back and forth. Um, but one, one intermediate part would be to say, well, for the things that are endogenous, exogenous, how do they relate to each other in terms of model maps? These are cause loop diagrams. I described these a little bit yesterday. Um, uh, some of you may be familiar with them. Um, I just want to remind you that we have variables. These variables have polarity associated with them, word, uh, with them or valence. So so, you know, you can have um, more health or lower health, uh, more employability or lower employability. And if we have a link between two variables, A and B, say from health to employability, what that indicates is that um, we posit, and this is us, you know, um, uh, we, we're, we're positing that as health increases, um, employability will will change uh, relative to value it otherwise would have had, all those things being equal. And the 
the um, polarity of that length, the fact is the plus length means as health goes up, employability will tend to go up compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all the other things being equal. So, so you know, as health goes up, employability goes up, we could say informally, right? Um, and, uh, you know, as risk of accidents and injuries go up, um, you know, costs uh, go up as well. Um, uh, as dysphoria and stress go up, impulse towards self-medication goes up. But there are some of these arrows which are associated with negative links. So for example, substance abuse may reduce a person's ability for productive work. Um, it may reduce the, the nutrition um, uh, associated with, with their situation, their ability to, to get good nutrition. Um, employability goes up, poverty will tend to go down. So when we have these negative links, um, uh, like those from, from this to this, uh, from risk of injury to health, that, that minus is really for this link, or from substance use to nutrition, it means as the first variable goes up, the second variable goes down compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all other things being equal. Now, I want to make, I want to disabuse you of a common misunderstanding that comes up with students comes up with these polarities, particularly the negative polarity, but to some degree the positive. What these are not saying, and I'm saying a lot, but one of the things they're not saying, one of the most critical things it's important to know they're not saying, they're not saying that as, you know, um, uh, substance abuse goes up, risk of injury and accidents goes up over time. No, it's, it goes up compared to the value it otherwise would have had if substance abuse hadn't gone up. Would have had some value and otherwise it's gonna hold a higher value compared to the value it otherwise would have had, other than this being equal. Um, so it'll tend to make it higher. Or in this case, substance abuse rising will tend to make capacity for productive work lower. It doesn't mean that lowering it over time necessarily in some you know, downward slope or something. Um, but it just means it's lowering it from what it would otherwise have been. So these sorts of causal diagrams are, are um, very widely used in system dynamics. Um, and you know, I provided some examples here. In system dynamics, there's a strong form, there's a strong uh, uh, element of wanting to identify the causal loops, the, the loops themselves, the, um, the feedback loops. For good reason, because you know the, the observation is in a lot of system, the feedbacks lead to have huge implications for behavior. They lead to stabilizing behavior or behavior that quickly gets sort of spirals out of control in a in a in a way that uh, gets um, um, unstable. Um, but our focus here is really on just sort of diagramming out four factors that are endogenous or endogenous. This may be something you want to kind of do, is sort of sketch out what influences what. So when you get started with the TA, you'll be able to show them this diagram and say, look, you know, this is like in my area, this is kind of what I have in mind is kind of um, what drives what. And that's useful to show kind of how these variables relate to each other. Because system science is all about connections. It's all about interconnections between things. It's all not just the pieces, it's how they're connected. And this illustrates something about how they're connected. Um, uh, and I'll try to dredge up some of the uh, agent based adaptations of these to show it you know, sometime in the next day or so. So, this is a second form that you might find useful. I'm, I'm gonna ask you to try something that you find resonates with you. So my first thought would be the endogenous, exogenous ignored, give that a shot. If that doesn't resonate with you, or if you go on from that and wanna try something else, maybe diagramming how your the major things in your mind, the major variables relate to one another, maybe that will be helpful because you can start to think about what might be captured in models as far as relationships in a simulation model. The third thing is something that relates to how an agent-based model would come out of it. And I have some text here. Um, um, 
and the text will kind of walk you through this in, in with greater loquacity than I can offer right now. But you know, I ask you some some basic questions. Um, you know, which pathways? When I say pathways, I'm talking about generative pathways or cause pathways like these, um, like posited um, uh, routes of influence from one variable to another. Often. We, we have some idea of what those pathways are and maybe, maybe um, you know, thinking about those is useful. But then you're gonna ask to, to think about model scope and, and for agent-based modeling, this framework I like to evolve. You know, like what are the, what are the agents? Um, and for each agent, what are the types of agents? Maybe there are people, maybe there are horses and trainers, maybe they are, um, you know, institutions, um, pharmaceutical companies, um, community organizations of certain sorts, and public health agencies. Right? Um, don't don't always think they're people. They they might be you know individual people. It might be uh, community organizations. It might be institutions, uh, etc. Um, but you know, think about what those agents are, what their state is. Uh, what sort of actions and rules do they have? What, what, what are the things that change the state? And what are the rules under which those occur? You might wanna go light on the rules initially, um, but, but have a sense of the state and things that change them. Maybe a, a state chart is useful for you. Start thinking through a state chart. You could even use any law to start kind of mapping it out. Um, but then think, you know, what are the kind of assumptions associated with some of these agents or attributes you want to, you really need to capture? I would say that endogenous, exogenous, um, ignored division might clue you into the what parameters you want to have, what what features of each agent you want to maintain, um, and then you know over what time frame do you want to. Analyze this. This is all questions like when someone brings a modeling problem to me, I often have exactly these discussions. So, you know, what time frame are you concerned about? Is it a three year time frame, a 30 year time frame, a 300 year time frame? What are the sort of what are the durations of time? What outcomes do you want to have from the model? You may wonder, like, why am I talking about that? It's because there may be certain outcomes that in order to calculate them, you need certain factors endogenous. Yep. If you can't calculate the, um, the number of overdoses without representing, um, uh, without representing some factors associated with uh, use of certain types of, of, of high rate drugs like fentanyl. Because of that, we need to represent fentanyl explicitly in our model because it's associated with 90% of overdose. So by thinking about the outcomes, often that clues you in to aspects of what needs to be endogenous. And so, you know, you're gonna be, it's also gonna be very relevant for building up the model, for trying to get something into the model. Um, uh, interventions, if, if you're focused on interventions, if part of your goal is to, to ask what if questions, um, you're gonna wanna ask what are those what if questions. Sometimes they're like policies or interventions, things we're intervening with the situation. Sometimes they are just what if situations about the external world, you know, what if the economy has a downturn? What if there's another wave of the pandemic? What if there's a, um, you know, a really um, high virulence um, variant that arrives? What if um, uh, the, you know, if there's a very high rates of, of environmental change um, that expose great heat risks to, to individuals, et cetera. Um, and then think about the network, you know, or, uh, is this something where we need to represent geographic space? Or could we deal with a stylized non-geographic space? You know, continuous spatially, spatially, but it's non-geographic. It doesn't actually represent an actual geography. It's more, you know, we have an urban region and a rural region, but it's not, you know, Montreal and, and the surrounds. It's not, 
you know, uh, Vancouver and Burnaby and Surrey, et cetera. It's, it's kind of um, more abstract. Or is it enough to have sort of gridded space where you can have it really abstract and things are interacting with themselves? Um, so to answer these, sometimes it can be useful to like create a little diagram, even in any logic for state charts that can illustrate the states, actions, rules, um, to the degree you get into them, that can be useful. Sometimes you could put in parameters, um, causal links. You can draw in any logic with transitions, um, um, or actually not with transitions, with uh, elements of the of the palette for agents, uh, for system dynamics, I can, I can show that. Um, uh, events, maybe. We haven't talked about those, but those would be things which occur at certain times and uh, potentially get everybody involved. I'm not sure you need it. So, so for thinking about agent-based modeling and unpacking it into these things, think about how these apply to your situation may be useful. So, you know, for this morning, don't, I wouldn't suggest trying to do this all. Try to find one of these that, that resonates with you, that you feel some basis for some booking you know. and I'd like you to give that a try okay um and uh I'm gonna try to muster the TAs um to to sort of try to start engaging with each team okay um so uh for those online um we're going to sort of go and um scatter uh, amongst a couple of rooms here. So um, I'm not sure you're going to get much um, utility out of, uh, uh, out of, you know, uh, staying, staying online here. We will reconvene after lunch. And what I'm going to be shooting for is roughly one, it'll be sometime between one and one, probably around 115 or so. Okay. Um, so that's about two hours from now. We're gonna go roughly an hour for this exercise and then get some lunch and then uh, be back around 115 to 130, okay? So if anyone would like to um, to stay on, they're welcome to do so. I'll probably mute it and um, we won't have the, the video on um, as well. So uh, thanks very much. And we'll be reconnecting with the online folks here in uh, after lunch, okay? Thank you. Yeah, uh, 115 to 130, thanks.